Hello, dear colleagues and friends. I'm Haneda Masashi, director of Tokyo College, and praise the role of moderator of today's uh, event. I am in Yasuda Auditorium uh, on Hongo campus of the University of Tokyo. Uh, we hold today's event uh, both on on-site and uh, online, uh, that is, in a hybrid format. I'm really excited and feel honored to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Natarajan Chandrasekharan, uh, the lecturer of today's event. Many of you know, so maybe uh, it is not necessary for me to introduce him, but uh, a very brief introduction uh, that he is the chairman of Tata Sons, one of the most important business groups in India and the world. The group has almost a million employees and its revenues counts more than 125 billion US dollars. Mr. Chandra Sekalan joined the Tata Consulting Service in 1987 and started his career as a software programmer. He became CEO and managing director of the company in uh, 29 at the, at the age of 46 then was appointed chairman uh, of the whole Tata Group in 2017. He published a thought-provoking provo book, Brigital Nation, Solving Technology's People Problem, in 2019. Without doubt, so, uh, he is one of the most influential and important business leaders in the world. Uh, before listening to uh, his lecture, uh, on behalf of the uh, whole University of Tokyo, uh, President uh, Fuji Tello addresses a welcome speech. President Fuji, please. Good morning, good evening, everyone. I'm Tello Fuji, President of the University of Tokyo. Distinguished guests, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all here in Yasuda Auditorium for the lecture by Chairman Chandra Sekaran of Tata Sons, one of the top conglomerates in the world. I would also like to welcome and thank those who are uh, joining us online. Mr. Chandra Sekaran, uh, on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of U Tokyo, I would also like to extend my deepest gratitude to you for visiting us in Japan all the way from India to deliver this lecture here today. Thank you so much. This lecture was in fact originally scheduled in February 2020, just, just after the outbreak of COVID-19. And it has been nearly uh, three years uh, since. So, and since then, as you know, our world has experienced an unusual situation with the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian military invasion of Ukraine. Though we could see a little uh, exit light from the pandemic, but still neither crisis shows any clear signs of resolution. And the profound economic impact on countries throughout the world is becoming more and more severe. So despite this difficult and challenging time, it is a great, play, a great honor to be able to finally welcome Mr. Chandra Sekhan here and I encourage our students to take this opportunity to learn now about the uh, global view of the ongoing digital revolution from the Tata Group's heritage that made it successful for over 150 years. Since I became president of the University of Tokyo last year, I have placed great emphasis on dialogue. Dialogue is not just having discussion or exchanging, inform exchanging information, 
But the, the dialogue is the act of trying to know something unknown and to understand. In order to tackle complex global issues, such as the pandemic and the conflict between countries, it is essential for us to try to understand different cultures and values. I believe that it will be a great opportunity for all the people who gather today to better understand each other through dialogue, especially the necessity and possibility of future relations between India and Japan. Born out of mutual respect and admiration between our countries and society. From our history of famous lectures, it was our great honor to have Sir Rabindranath Tagore, the noted Indian poet and the first Asian Nobel laureate in literature in 1913. He gave his lecture message of India to Japan on our campus in 1916 when he visited Japan for the first time. And it was the first lecture in Japan by the great Indian soul. In fact, his portrait was gifted to our library by the first Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru when he visited our campus in 1957. I hope that today's lecture, given in the year of the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between India and Japan, will be another great milestone to further strengthen our collaboration between the two countries. Thank you again, Mr. Chandra Sekaran, for coming to U Tokyo and delivering our lecture today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, President Fuji. Now we look forward to uh, Mr. Chandra Sekaran's uh, lecture on digital revolution, data led prosperity in the 21st century. Uh, please. Uh, please applaud Mr. Chang from the second. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Haneda. Professor Huji, faculty, and dear students, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. It is a real honor to stand here in a place where for almost 150 years, great leaders have shared their ideas. This university has produced some of the most influential thinkers, prime ministers, and Nobel laureates. It is a great privilege to join you all and share a few reflections that I hope will help you on your journey as leaders of tomorrow. For me, it's an absolute pleasure to be back in Japan again after three years. Anytime I visit here, it is a joy. Celebrating 70 years of diplomatic ties between Japan and India this year, so this occasion is a special one. The bonds between our two countries are very, very important. India and Japan are two of the largest and oldest democracies in Asia. We share a great deal of history, trade and commerce. But our ties are not just diplomatic or economic. We are also united by something very deeper. I believe we share common values and more importantly, we share our outlook of the world. 
from buddhist traditions to our post war cooperation and reconstruction that saw both of our nations flourish to recently prime minister Shin shinzo abe's arc of democracy a vision of a peaceful collaborative nations united in self governance stretching from pacific to the indian ocean this democratic ideal of freedom openness tolerance progress and prosperity depends on one thing that is education without learning without places where curiosity is nurtured progress is impossible learning and curiosity are both the fundamental ingredients for leadership curiosity also entails an interest in traveling to other places and learning other cultures it is something that both of our countries cherish the great indian philosopher swami vivekananda said i quote in my opinion if all of our rich and educated men once go and see japan their eyes will be opened so that's what i want to talk today how to open our eyes to the world and take an interest in other cultures and ideas and also what is happening on technology to build a better and brighter future for us and for the world after all the intellectual curiosity lies at the root of tata group's success jamshed ji tata our founder had the hunger to travel and learn and that fundamentally helped him to succeed in an age of profound economic upheaval he brought back several ideas from different parts of the world he came back with ideas from england and then the lancashire cotton trade he came to japan and brought back the concept of silk making and he hired experts from japan and also imported the machinery from here to revive the silk silk making in india he went to new york and set up a venture to gather data about coal iron and limestone and using that he created steel industry and from our other from other engineers who inspired him he learned the need for electric power hydroelectric power and set up a hydroelectric power plant in the early 1900s though he didn't live to see the completion of all his projects jamshed ji's work and lifelong curiosity continued right up until his death the subsequent chairman of the tata group have continued this legacy and have constantly diversified identified and picked growth markets and learned from the trends in all those markets internationally and diversified the group that is why we are a group with such a large footprint today most of our companies are 50 60 80 100 years old and this kind of curiosity matters even more now the doctrine of curiosity has deeply shaped my own career in my work i have been lucky enough to learn a lot constantly i started as an intern in the tata group in 1986 and since then I have spent 36 years i have been fortunate to work in such a purpose driven group across different continents and multiple international locations and through that experience i want to share some of my learnings it is important fundamentally to create an environment where people feel free to set audacious targets and work towards to meet them even if they fail multiple times as a leader you shoulder many challenges 
many times people will tell you that something cannot be done or why you are doing this or exit certain business ventures or give up trying something new i have heard this multiple times across businesses often backed by very very sound logic one is totally justifiable but even then when you are curious when you feel the urge to explore and create what might not make sense to an observer can make a lot of sense to you as a leader from where you operate from being able to see the potential of something new is a distinctive trait that needs to be cultivated learning doesn't end at this university in fact it is just the beginning a school principal once very wisely said the best education does not prepare students to pass an exam in a college or even to get a job it prepares them to keep learning life long now i would like to talk about the key topic of today which is about the digital revolution what is the status today and what does the future look like when you look back over the last 10 years a number of new technologies have been evolving rapidly and they are transforming individuals life industries societies and nations we loosely refer to them as digital technologies basically the advancements in computing mobile data network and internet laid the foundation for a new kind of revolution the birth of the cloud brought the ability to store and process huge volumes of data internet of things and sensors provide us the ability to capture data about anything and everything but on top of that two important technologies artificial intelligence and machine learning is making a huge impact ai has enabled machines to perform tasks that require human level intelligence machine learning is enabling technology to acquire the knowledge and capability at a much shorter timeline than the humans can learn these two technologies have been expanding their reach and providing impact with a variety of applications in diverse sectors from medicine transportation environmental production protection automotive mobility defense etc these have hugely impacted these two technologies have hugely impacted social networking platforms like google facebook whatsapp and has fundamentally changed how the individuals conduct their daily lives in the recent years ai and machine learning have made huge strides and have created profound impact in many fields machine learning fundamentally requires a lot of data without which ai cannot learn good models but the with, with the exponential growth and availability of data and the ability to process that data the promise of ai and machine learning has already been demonstrated the computing power that is required to operate a sophisticated ai is available today so in the future there will be very very few fields that will remain unaffected by ai the ai and machine learning methods have taken ai from beating human chess experts experts to discovering entirely new chess strategies and techniques they no longer depend on learning from the past moves the early versions of machines which were used to play chess always used to learn from the past games that is no longer required today the ai and machine learning can fundamentally start with a new strategy and then beat the humans who are experts at the game in agriculture ai is facilitating precise administration of pesticides 
detection of diseases and prediction of crop yields. In education, AI is already being applied to learning and teaching. Adjusting learning based on individual students' needs has always been required for years. But today, AI is making it possible. Although machines today can grade multiple choice questions, AI is getting close to being able to assess written responses as well. AI's most significant promise for humanity will happen in healthcare. In medicine, it is already facilitating discovery of new drugs faster. For example, the, the vaccines we got for COVID-19. Identification of new applications of existing drugs, as well as the detection and prevention of future maladies. AI has identified breast cancer earlier than human doctors could do by detecting subtle radiological indicators. It has already found retinopathy, one of the leading causes of blindness by analyzing retinal changes. AI models are providing personalized recommendations on nutrition and exercise using glucose biomarkers and aiding detection of hyper and hypoglycemic conditions in diabetes based on medical history. So you see a lot of wearable devices today, patches or rings or multiple methods, all of these are AI and machine learning enabled. Trends such as AI, IoT and connected vehicles are coming together and changing the cities we live in. AI solutions are enabling intelligent routing of public transport, very efficient waste collection and reducing energy consumption. AI can also help greatly by addressing climate change challenges. For example, AI is being used in conjunction with satellite imagery to identify deforestation and illegal logging activity in rainforests, as well as illegal fishing activity, which impacts biodiversity in the oceans. Moving on to financial services, AI is being leveraged today very commonly for approving loans based on predicted behavior of the borrower. Banks are leveraging AI to detect anomalies by analyzing customers' spending patterns and protect them from fraud. Similarly, in retail and online commerce, retailers today have deep insights into consumers' buying behavior. They exactly know which products we are shopping for, our past buying patterns, and our ability to spend. AI is playing a key role in enabling a great and personalized shopping experience for all of us. Manufacturing has evolved over the decades from being heavily human-centered to machine-reliant to being highly automated currently. Data collected from IoT devices on the plant flow, plant flow is being used to improve yield, throughput, and efficiency. AI solutions can interpret a machine's condition, detect abnormalities, and fix the machines even before they fail. So, so much is happening in this digital world by use of AI and machine learning. But looking at the future, the future of AI and machine learning is basically for us to imagine because the possibilities are limitless. It is what we want to accomplish using machine learning. The scope is there. For example, Many years ago, I used to give the example of the future of air travel, which will be completely contactless, where you walk in just with your facial recognition, you will be detected either for immigration or for customs or for guiding you to the right gate or even entry into the aircraft. Slowly, multiple stages of this is becoming a reality. One day, in the near future, we will be able to walk into an airport, get dropped from the car and straight away walk to the aircraft without anybody interfacing with you or you showing any documents because just with your facial recognition, everything can be checked. In the future, you take children. Children may grow up with AI assistance, 
much more advanced than the Alexas or the Google assistants that we, we see today. These assistants will be many things at once. The assistant will be a babysitter, could be a tutor, an advisor or a friend. Such assistants will be able to teach children virtually any language or train children on any subject. Also calibrate the style of teaching based on the individual child's performance and learning style. AI will serve as a playmate when the child is bored and also will become a monitor when the child's parent is away. Over time, individuals may come to prefer their digital assistants over humans. It has huge implications. As a result, our dependence on one another, on human relationships, will decrease. Children will grow up with machines that will act as human machines, but their companions but they will not have human sensibilities, insight, or emotions. It has its own implications, and it is a totally uncharted territory. And we need to think about that. If this is the range of possibility, this is also about making impact on society and on public services. AI is making a big impact on large-scale development initiatives and social programs being undertaken by several nations at scale. In the Indian context, as part of the Digital India Initiative, a number of technology-led platforms are being developed which are accessible to a large section of the population. The mission is to make these digital interventions accessible and beneficial to everyone. The foundation for this is again a strong digital infrastructure which is being made available to every citizen irrespective of where they live or irrespective of whether they are rich or poor or educated or not educated. Broadband for all, rural and urban, universal access to mobile connectivity where mobile network penetration is being expanded to all the nook and corner of the country. Another key initiative at the core of the transformation that is happening in India is what we call as Aadhaar. The Aadhaar means foundation in our language. Aadhaar is the world's largest biometric identity program and it has given every Indian a digital identity, an identity on the cloud which can be used anywhere in India. It has become the backbone for the digital verification of every citizen. This has led to linking the identity to many systems, including the banking system. It supports movement of money from the government to beneficiaries, for example, be it pensions or scholarships. India has the largest direct benefit transfer program, and this was at the heart of success during the pandemic, where the government was able to send money to more than 100 million Indians at the lowest start of the society during the pandemic, totally electronically and instantaneously. Another big success story in India is in the digital payments, which is another platform called the UPI, Unified Payment Interface. The UPI enables electronic remittance as well as retail payments. There are 358 banks on this platform with a monthly volume of 6.7 billion transactions from small vendors to large businesses, digital payments have reached every corner of the country. In fact, in most places, people don't accept money. If you meet with a street vendor while walking in the street and someone wants to serve you a coconut water, you cannot pay him by cash. You can only do a Google Pay because he, is, he has got his account linked to UPI. This scale of adoption has led to India becoming world's largest re real-time payments market. Going forward, I expect 
multiple platforms in India to come from different verticals. There will be a platform for education, there will be a platform for skilling, there will be a platform for healthcare. These platforms will ensure that particular service, be it education or a skill building or healthcare services is available to every citizen. So the potential of uh, digital technologies, the basic digital infrastructure and a well thought out artificial intelligence and machine learning has the potential to transform every country, India and other countries. Now I would like to share a little bit thoughts on what we are doing in the Tata group in the digital space. At the Tata group, transition to a digital future is one of the three big transitions that all our companies are going through. The other two being energy transition and supply chain resilience. Tata companies are accelerating adoption of digital techno technologies to transform their core business, to change how their products and services are imagined and how they serve customers and how they engage employees and how the operations are run. Digitalization is a journey where every company needs to think data first and then have to think of AI and machine learning algorithms in the context of their business. This journey has been initiated across multiple companies and multiple industries, be it consumer businesses or financial services or manufacturing and industrial businesses. All our companies have set up their own centers of excellence to build AI use cases that will create the maximum business impact. The results from investments in AI and machine learning are very encouraging already and the business value is clearly visible. For example, in our retail companies, AI powered visual search, virtual try-ons, video and assisted commerce are helping our retail companies catered to new age consumer expectations. Today, companies are able to directly correlate the value of AI driven personalization to sales uplift and revenue growth. Blending tea is a very complex process and you in Japan will know that. It involves as many as 170 varieties to create an extensive range of tea brands. In our consumer business, AI models are helping identify the perfect blend of tea at an optimal cost. In our general insurance business, computer vision models have made virtual vehicles to be inspected a reality. This is fast replacing the need for in-person vehicle inspection. This is not only driving efficiencies, but also create service differentiation. In a world industry like steel, our company has set up an automated factory where production happens without direct human intervention on site. AI models analyze the voice data and video feeds in real time and the operations are monitored totally remotely from a controlled room in a different city. Our chemical company has been working on creating a digital twin in their soda ash plant. The digital twin simulates the entire carbonation process to recommend the most optimal settings for the operator. This is a great example of high of how AI assisted operations is possible even in a very legacy business. As our group companies get ready for the future, the digital transition will be one of the most important transition that we will go through in the next few years. Now I want to say a few words about the India-Japan relationship. As I said earlier, India and Japan are two of the largest and oldest democracies in Asia. I don't know how many, how many of you know this, but the Tata group was amongst the first and earliest to establish commercial ties between India and Japan. RD Tata was the first person to ship Indian cotton to Japan in 18, 
1893, Tata Sons established its first commercial relationship with Japanese NYK. Today, our ties are stronger than ever. In 2020, India became the 18th largest business partner for Japan. I know 18 is 18, it's not 2, but it was somewhere around 30. So we have made progress. At the same time, Japan became the 12th largest business partner for India and more than 1,400 Japanese companies are present today in India. Japanese companies have made significant bets in India. Even recently, Japan has provided the financing for the Delhi Metro project and now the high-speed rail line between Mumbai and Ahmedabad, which is being built using Shinkansen technology. Japan has world-leading practices and leadership in manufacturing and quality, and India has the scale and best digital talent. Together, there is a huge opportunity, especially in the current geopolitical climate, to create a strong next generation supply base in India by Japan and India coming together, not only to serve Japan and India, but to serve the world. We can partner to create, rather imagine, exciting new businesses together by reimagining machine learning and AI in multiple industries. We are in the midst of an extraordinary time. This decade holds so much promise because literally we are going to rebuild the future of businesses and societies. One, because of AI and machine learning transition. Two, because of the energy transition. Three, because the supply chain, value chain is going to get redefined. And we are going to not only create alternatives, but we are going to create resilience. We must e equip the young people, not just for today, but prepare them for the economy of tomorrow. Universities like the Tokyo University can play a leading and vital role by anticipating the future, by anticipating the growth sectors of the future and providing opportunity for curiosity. We have the right human capital, we have the scale, we need to make the right investments both as citizens and as nations and as partners to anticipate the disruptions that are playing out just in front of our eyes. If you do that, the future generation will be the most consequential generation in our history. If you get all this right, the curiosity in young people, the leadership to nurture learning and curiosity and empower people and understand the future of technology and prepare ourselves for that, I am pretty confident that our shared future will be very bright. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chandra Sekaram, for delivering a superb, really superb lecture today about the leadership based on your life experience in becoming a leader of the global India's foremost company. The learnings from Tata Group's heritage that made it successful for over 150 years and the vision for striving in the future led by digital revolution, in particular, limitless and ethical AI machine learning and digital platforms. I found the 
really at the heart of, of Mr. Chairman and also Tata Group, a lifelong curiosity. That is the strength of, of the uh, entire, your entire organization. Lifelong curiosity. I believe I have that too, but uh, right. That's, that's, the, that's a great uh, uh, the, the, the word you have. So, and then today I can see uh, uh, the, a lot of people in this audience are from India, which shows a strong relation between the India and Japan. According to the statistics of the University of Tokyo, the number of Indian students have doubled since 2014 and tripled since 2012. There are now nearly 100 Indian students in University of Tokyo. And I wish to welcome more Indian students as well as hoping that uh, there will be more Japanese students who visit India. In closing, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Embassy of India, members of the Indian community in University of Tokyo, such as uh, UTISA, University of Tokyo Indian Student Association, members of TCS Japan, Tata Communications Japan, for their tremendous effort in making this incredibly successful event possible. I am confident that the relationship between our countries, including academia and industries, will continue and prosper for many years to come. Thank you very much for all. And this concludes today's event. Thank you very much, audience, all of you, for your attendance today. And please clap your hands once again.